Um, like I mentioned earlier, this sign, um, which I have a picture of here, um, is using existing material, will not have any additional um, entrances into the building or attachments to the brick. Um, it's just using an existing signpost. Um, city staff finds that city ordinance criteria B, C, D, E, F, and G all relate to this proposition, as well as our design guidelines chapter 10, which talk about signs. Um, and this does meet several of that, the criteria on there that it shouldn't cover up distinguishing architectural features, um, should be signage related to that building. Um, so it ticks all the boxes with that. Um, the applicant is here. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions you have after public comment. First of all, will I ask for any public comment on this? Okay, and, and if, if there's not any, we'll close that. Uh, I don't. I don't know if Scott would you like to come and tell us about this, or if you if you want to. Do I need to say my name and address? My name? Right. Scott Runnels, uh, home address 207 Pine Street, Nacogdoches, Texas, representing Reach at 418 East Main Street. Um, I think most of the pertinent information is, uh, is on this request, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, the one thing I will add that I don't know that I put in here is that the method of attachment to that pole will not pierce that pole. So we're going to use an attachment method that goes on the outside of the pole So for a number of reasons. Uh, so it'll it'll attach by friction to that pole. Okay, if that helps. All right. Any questions of Scott? Do you have any intention of painting that pole? Okay, so we yeah, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? So we're looking at that. We don't right now for the sign project. We would love to do that, uh, just as soon as we figure out a, a cost-effective and safe way to do that, and also one that that takes into account anything, because we're going to have to abate that rust, first of all. Uh, and so whatever, I don't know if we're going to need to take a grinder to it or have it, I, I'd hate to try to even pretend to have it removed to have it sandblast or anything like that because mm -hmm. I, I think that would probably damage the exterior and be a huge pain. Uh, but yeah, that would make it a lot nicer looking. We, we considered that and it was like, all right, how much trouble do you want to go to for the sign? And so for the sign itself, we're doing that. We would eventually like to do that. So uh, to answer your question directly, not part of this sign project, yeah, we'd like to do that at some point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, do I have a motion concerning this certificate of appropriateness? I make a motion we approve um, COA 2024027 on the criteria B, C, D, E, F, and G. Okay, second. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. All right, any discussion? No discussion, okay. If there's no discussion, we'll call for a vote. All in favor of a granting this certificate of appropriateness, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, all right, we'll go to the next one there on, uh, on Mound Street. Jessica, thank you. Uh, this item is uh, discuss and consider COA request for property located at 510 North Mound Street, uh, COA 2024-028. The applicant is Jamie Carrillo, um, and the property owner is Robin Gillespie. Um, they have a pretty extensive request, so I'm going to go through this, and then um, the applicant is also here if you have any questions of them. Um, so this building, um, I'm going to start with a little bit of history of it because that's a little bit faster. Um, it's constructed in 1925. Um, it's over on Mound Street. It's most people here in town know it as the Candy House. Um, it's been vacant for several years, um, and the applicant knows the building was constructed in 1925. This addition that we're going to talk about today was probably sometime in the 1950s. Um, so this is not part of the original structure itself. Um, what they're requesting to do is replace rotten wood in multiple areas of the house, um, some on the front, some on the back. Um, a lot around the window trim and then repaint the window trim to an urban bronze color that they've provided it's in your packet and I'll go to that slide in a minute. Um, they are also requesting um, the biggest part of this request is an addition to the guest house that's in the back. Um, the guest house is not visible from the street. Um, it's an addition to the back of the house and with this request they would be um, altering the interior of the building um, but also adding a 15-foot extension to this guest house, also a covered porch on the end of that and then with an exterior fireplace. Um, eventually with a pool in the backyard as well. Um, this addition 
to the addition, um, would not use that same wooden siding that's on there right now. Um, their intent is to use more of the stucco that you'll see in different elements on the front of the house to make it a bit more cohesive. Um, they're also requesting to add a new wooden privacy fence to match their neighbor's fence. Um, and like I mentioned, these additions will not be seen from the street. Um, I do have some pictures that were provided by the applicant. Um, this is the existing structure. You can see some of the stucco in the top left picture. Um, they are proposing to um, use that same color stucco with the Sherwin-Williams Greek Villa color, um, which will complement the existing brick. And then the urban bronze is the color that would go around all the window trim. Um, this is a few pictures of what it could look like. Um, they also supplied pictures of their existing fence and the new fence that would match their neighbors. Um, we also on, have on here the existing layout, which you can see on the top. Um, the new layout on the bottom, of course, everything interior does not change the exterior of it. So really what you're looking at is the 15-foot extension plus the covered porch um, that would match the same roof line as the extension um, and the fireplace in the back. Um, you can see here is another, um, like I mentioned, on the top is the existing elevation. On the bottom is the proposed elevation. And this is the site plan. So you would have the home in the front, the guest house, and then the addition directly behind it. Um, staff finds that city ordinance criteria B, C, D, E, F, J, and K all relate to this project since it's very big and will affect um, this property. Um, and of course, like I mentioned, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And then the owner is here as well. Owner and applicant um, are happy to answer those after public comment. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Mm -hmm. All right, first of all, if there's any public comment on this item. <coughs> all right, seeing there's not any, we'll close that part. Uh, I, I guess, if, if, would you like to speak to the, is the owner here? Would you like to come, they may have questions, we may have questions of you. <laughs> And this is Jessica Carrillo. Okay. Thank, thanks for coming. Uh -huh. And welcome to the historic district. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody have questions of any of these ladies? Now, this is going to be along the back side of the house, right? That's yes, right. Okay. Will it be facing north and south or east and west? Which direction will it be? North, east, east and west. west. It'll go east and west. The same so direction it. as the... Uh, current guest house. Okay. Okay. So it'll be a deep lot in going back that way. Correct. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? I just like to know for sure the first lit of glass windows in the front of the main thing about that house. You are planning on preserving those? Absolutely. One of, one of them needs to be replaced. Right. One of them needs to be replaced. There is a plate glass that I guess the previous owner put in yeah, there and they've gotten broken. But yes, we want to replace it and okay. restore it back to its original condition. That makes that house unique. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I love the windows. Oh, yes. So. Well, I hope that the, uh, I'm very glad that you tackling that project and I hope when you get it finished you put it on a tour of homes Christmas tour of homes so we can all see it I would love to <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea John thank you I, thank I you. Would love yeah. give, me, give me a few years yeah. So, yeah. well okay I'll we'll give you about 12 months <laughs> next, this Christmas yeah, next Christmas okay. all right anybody else well, when do you plan on putting in the pool and where will that go um, it goes beside the guest house, the back apartment. If you can reference the floor plan yeah, and the site right. plan, the pool's on the site plan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do I have the right path, I guess? Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah, the yeah. pool on that side is kind of the bottom right. Okay. I was trying to see if there was a number on this page, but I don't see one. But it says site plan with pool addition. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, do I have a motion concerning this COA? Uh, I make a motion that we approve the COA with the, uh, let's see what all those numbers are, with the criteria that meets B, C, D, E, F, J, and K. Okay. 
I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay. All right. All in favor of this motion of approving the COA, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. And Chris is voting. Yeah, it's I see him up there. Okay. Yeah, we're watching and writing this stuff down, okay. too. <laughs> a, a thumbs up doesn't count, Chris. We can hear it. All right, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the next item. Uh, discuss the certificate of appropriateness for uh, 110 North Pecan. Yes, and this is COA 2024-029. Um, the applicant is uh, Jeff Whitfield and Jimmy Mize of Commercial Bank of Texas. Um, 110 North Pecan Street is commonly referred to as the Baxter Building. It's right behind Commercial Bank, um, so that's how most people refer to it. Um, so we'll just use that. Um, what they are requesting to do is replace an existing roll-top garage door um, with a garage door to match one on the other part of the building to make it a little bit more cohesive. Uh, replace two back doors, add a concrete walkway, um, and paint the existing brick to match the other portion of the building, which is painted brick. Um, so this building um, is part of the downtown historic district, but it wasn't individually um, surveyed during our uh, downtown survey of historic properties. It's a little bit newer addition um, to the downtown area, so it's not listed as contributing or non-contributing. It's not listed at all. Um, so they are requesting to remove an existing roll-top garage door, replace it with a glass and metal door to match, remove two doors to match color and style of a different two doors on the building, adding concrete walkway and paint the building to match. And so I have a few pictures here. Um, this is what you normally see when you drive down the street to see the Baxter Building, um, 110 North Pecan Street. Um, one roll top garage door um, is on the bottom um, and they are requesting to replace the white one on the top with one to match that one on the bottom. Um, back to these doors, these are the two doors they're requesting to replace and match other building or other doors on the building and also put a walkway, which you can see in yellow on that top picture. Um, also, the brick on the vast majority of this building is painted a brick red. Um, so it, I don't know what color brick it was originally. Um, it may have been a red brick, but it is painted brick on the majority of it. Um, so they are requesting to paint the rest of the building to match um, the existing red paint. Um, I'm Staff is happy to answer any questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, city ordinance criteria B, D, E, F, J, and K apply to this request. Um, the applicant is here. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions after public comment as well as the applicant. Okay. All right, first we'll have uh, open for public comment on this COA. All right, seeing that there is none, we'll go, uh, we'll, I, you know, if you guys want to come up and tell us about it, we may have questions for you. We'll drill you really good. Yeah, good. <laughs> good. Um, the, the building, I'm sorry, I'm Jimmy Mize, live at 820 Texas Street, and uh, uh, work for Commercial Bank at 215 East Main, and uh, we uh, have owned this property, actually the, the part that's fixed for quite a, a number of years, uh, and, and the last five to six years, we found uh, use for it as an event center. So uh, I think we kind of started out, we air-conditioned it, and we got a bathroom that was functioning, and uh, we used it for parades, and then we found that people wanted to borrow the building and have, you know, uh, wedding showers and baby showers and, and different things like that there. So we, we've enjoyed supplying it for that. Uh, at some point, it and the building next to it were, were separated. Ownership was separated, uh, and it was walled up between them, so you can't pass between the two. And so we, for years, wanted to get that second building back and, and fix it to maybe to, to more match the, the event center that we have. And also... Uh, right now with the event center, it's our storage place, and then we have an event, we pull our stuff out and stick it somewhere. So our idea was that we'll have that adjacent space and we can use that as storage and maybe prep or, or just, just whatever. So anyway, all that said, uh, we've got a flooding problem with the existing building coming in the back, and so we're going to put in a cistern pump system to, to pump water out, and then that sidewalk you see, and that'll, that'll go into that, that back door. I guess, can you change that? It's on... I mean, okay. Yeah, so on there, that uh, that back door that you see, water comes in that door, so we're going to lower it and put a pump to where when you pump water out, the water won't come in the back, but we'll also put access there. Right now, to get into the building, we typically come in through the garage door, so if it's hot, you raise the garage door to let somebody in and lower it. So we're going to have an entrance that comes in actually off of our parking lot coming to the back of the building. 
but then we will also uh, plan to open it up so we can move between the buildings, put the door back in where it was inside to pass through that second building. And then on the front of it, uh, you see that's our finished door the, the, with the metal and the glass. And then you see the white aluminum roll-up door. We want to do something that more that kind of matches matches our door there. And then the paint colors, we want to you know, be consistent. Those are, uh, that, that's dock height, and then the one that's been filled in with the red brick, you see what's white with the red around it, that was, that was a dock height spot too. I think it was <coughs> added on to the old tire store or auto repair shop um, as storage, you know, at, at one time. So okay. we kind of want to make it into a, right. something for downtown. Any questions? And our contract, Johnny's going to do the work for us and has done a lot of work around the bank and really done a great job. So okay. we think that no, thank you. Okay. <coughs> okay. Do I have a motion for this COA? I move that COA number <coughs> 2024 029 be approved based on criteria D, D, E, F, J, and K. I second the motion. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right. All in favor of this motion of appropriateness. Aye. 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 Thanks, Chris. <laughs> okay. <coughs> now we have a, on Cox in Virginia. Uh, this COA is a uh, COA 2024-026. It's for boring and installation of fiber optic lines um, in utility boxes, <coughs> um, essentially around West Cox, Virginia, Sunset, and Bremen Street in the Virginia Avenue Historic District. Um, you all may be familiar with this. This is um, the third time we've seen an application like this with Vexus Fiber, um, who is the applicant um, and is here today can, that they can answer any questions you may have. Um, so this is essentially the same thing they've come before us two other times, but just in a different historic district. Um, so they are doing their due diligence. Um, the only thing that's going to be added visually to this historic district other than construction um, while that's ongoing is these 11 utility boxes. Um, so they are requesting to install six to board six to eight feet under the areas of West Cox, Virginia, Sunset, and Bremen Street, um, and then install 11 flush-mounted permanent utility boxes, um, which will be similar to the last couple we've seen. Um, they're called the flower box or the flat utility boxes. So. They're taller, but once they're installed, they're mainly underground, and you will just see that green top. Um, <clears throat> they are coming to us today to request um, installation, essentially, of these, because the rest of the boring work is essentially like any other utility work. It will run along city utility lines, and you won't see them disturbing all the dirt along all those lines. They drill down and bore under, so you're not going to see the entire sidewalk or anything like that ripped up. Um, but that is the request. Um, staff find that B, C, I, and K uh, relate to this proposal, um, and staff is happy to answer any questions you may have after public comment, and like I mentioned, the applicant is here as well. Okay. Any pub the public is dwindled here. <laughs> <laughs> so if, you, if you'd like, we'll just bring you right up here. If you, if you may have, they may not have questions of you, but you'll... In Rusty Ergen, uh, 7325 FM 225 Christian, Texas. That's where I've lived my whole life. Uh, my brothers are firefighters in Nacogdoches in the city for the last 20 years. Uh, it's very important to me to take care of Nacogdoches and, and restore. I, I'm, a, I'm over OSP, so I'm over the restoration and making sure the grass gets put back, that everything looks nice. Okay. And that's that's kind of my role. Okay. Any questions? Well, if I remember when we approved the one for Washington Square, didn't we ask that an archaeologist be available to help oversee that? I can answer that. Well, yeah, I, just, no, I wasn't here for that. No, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, we did a request that Vexus had an archaeologist on site when the boreholes were dug. Um, that was mainly because Washington Square itself is listed as a state archaeological landmark as a district. Um, so, of course, you can request that they have an archaeologist on site. Um, Virginia Avenue um, is really listed as a historic district because of the homes and the cohesiveness of that time period. Mm -hmm. um, but you're more than welcome to request that. But specifically for Washington Square, that's where the previous two requests were. Um, and that entire district <coughs> is an archaeological landmark. Okay. All right. How deep are these things? Uh, 
Uh, we usually try to stay between six to eight foot. So, it, I mean, it's pretty okay. deep. But the, as far as the green boxes, they're just where you can see the lids. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? All right. Do I hear a motion on this COA? I move that we approve, approve the COA 2024-06 so it meets the criteria of BC1 and K, or I and K. Okay, a second? I second the motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. Say aye. 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 Okay. All right, great. Okay, we'll go to the next item, Jessica. And that was your last COA for the day. The rest of these are just discussion items. Um, so our next item, 4E, is receive presentation and discuss proposed updates for Chapter 50 of the Natchitoches Code of Ordinances. Um, this change was requested by City Council, um, and so we are bringing this to you today. Um, like with any ordinance changes, this is a proposal to y'all to give your feedback, but then ultimate approval would go through our City Council. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the intent of this update is to address certificate of appropriateness reapplications and then create parameters for those reapplications. Um, currently, um, really just by practice, if someone um, brings a COA to HLPC and it's denied, um, the practice has been if they want to reapply next month and the month after, um, as many times as they want to, they're welcome to come back. Um, what this ordinance would do would limit that a bit um, as far as reapplication with the exact same um, application. Um, so you couldn't say, I want to paint this building purple, and if y'all deny it, come to the next month and say, I still want to paint it purple, I'm going to keep asking. Um, but if there was a concern brought up that, you know, I really don't like this style, I don't feel like this material is appropriate, and then the applicant comes back with a refreshed proposal that addresses the concerns, they could do that. Um, so essentially, um, you'll see, oh, I don't put that. I didn't put that on the PowerPoint. Um, so in your packet today, um, the only item that has been added to the ordinance um, is in red. Um, it's under section 50-161, item B. Um, so really saying if application for certificate of appropriateness and denied, a new application involving the same subject matter shall not be considered for 180 days. Um, still after 180 days, if their application is the exact same, um, with this ordinance update, they would be able to bring back the same application without any changes to it. Um, but if they would like to bring an application for an entirely new project or an applicant that has multiple properties or if they want to bring an applicant, a revised application that specifically addresses the reasons for denial, they can bring back that at any time. Um, so that is what the proposal is for your ordinance update. Um, I'm happy to hear any feedback that then, of course, uh, myself and the city attorney will take to city council for consideration. Okay, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been many years. <coughs> This, I'm only recent back on this committee, but decades ago I served on this committee. And at that time we understood the, the law that if this, this committee uh, moved one way or the other, then their, only, their recourse was to go to the city council. Now this seems to be like they could forever keep coming back to us and this idea of going to the city council. What... How does that work now? I can answer how we... Bit. So as of right now, and Jerry, um, you're welcome. To hop or when did that change? <clears throat> so as far as I know, in our ordinance, we've never had anything that's prohibited anybody from coming back multiple times in a row. Um, most people have taken the approach that if, if HLPC has denied it, that they, by right, can go to, a, can go to city council to appeal. Yes. So almost everyone's taken that route but there hasn't been anything preventing them from coming multiple times. We've just had several applicants recently that have said, well, I want to take a different, I want to take another front end. Keep coming back. Yes, and so there, there hasn't been that, that hasn't happened often throughout HLPC's history, um, but there's never been anything that would prevent that from happening. It's just been by practice. Okay. If they don't like HLPC's decision, they can go to okay. city council. Where was I wrong back then? Back then, we say we deny this or approve, mm -hmm. and that was it. They don't come back. That's how we had understood. Was that wrong back then, the way we handled that? In other words, their only recourse <coughs> at that point was to go to the city council. Sir, Jerry Baker, city attorney. Sure. Um, I don't think you're wrong in that assessment. I just think that's uh, it's not specified 
that I they see. can't rebring it. So because sure. it's not specified, it's really a technicality that allows them to do so unless we put this in the ordinance okay. to prohibit it. And so because that wasn't set forth specifically, you, you want know, it specifically. It, it okay. kind of opened a door there, and, and, and some people had, ta had taken advantage of it. And so in order to address that, I looked at other cities that had, you know, similar historic areas like this and historic districts and see how they addressed it. And so this was, you know, based on my review of those other cities and, uh, and essentially crafting that to try, to try to address this issue. You know, like Jessica said, it hasn't been an issue until kind of recently. And so based on that, uh, I was asked by a city council person to look into it to Put see what the option is. Okay. Yes. So the way I understand this, <coughs> we either approve or deny a COA, okay? They can immediately appeal it to the city council, right. even now. Correct. But they can't come back to us for 180 days, right? Unless they give you yes. a new application that addresses why you denied it. Or it's a okay. owner with a different property or a different project on that same property. Yeah, property. I agree. Okay. Exact, basically, it permits the exact <coughs> same application to be resubmitted the next month. Okay. So if they change materials, That's colors, it. any of that sort of thing, they could come back. It's a spam blocker. Yes. <laughs> Chris had a spam blocker, pretty much. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm sorry I hogged the whole thing. Anybody? Oh, no. Go right ahead. I had the exact same I have a question about that because I knew that they could appeal it to the city council. I don't. I'd already had understood it. It was forever. You know, if we turned it down, your only hope is the city council. So I guess it's it's only 180 days. Okay. So if if this is passed by the city council, yeah, that would be the end. Okay. Anybody else? How did you determine the 180 days? Um, so like Jerry mentioned, he looked at quite a few cities, and they really kind of run the gamut. Some say you can't come back for a year. Um, some say 30 days, 60 days. Um, and so 180 days seem to be relatively common. Um, also from the staff and historic preservation side, it was looked at that 180 days is enough of a waiting period where they, they have a chance to redo their mm -hmm. application. Um, because, of course, we don't want to give the perception that historic preservation is hard. Um, because it's hard, people stop doing it. Um, so my fear on the staff side is if we say for a year, people are going to say, I'm going to do it anyway, and ask for forgiveness, which gets us into a whole other battle. So 180 days was a pretty common time frame we saw amongst a lot of cities. Um, but there were some that said 30 days, and there were some, which I don't understand why that was in their ordinance, because our meetings every month. Um, but some said 30 days, others said a year. But that was just a kind of a common ground. Okay. And of course, if HLPC has a recommendation that you think it should be a year or it should be 30 days, you're more than welcome to recommend that, and we can take that recommendation to council. Right. Um, so this is not set in stone. This is just for your discussion today. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I don't know how. Uh, <laughs> do you want us to make a motion that we ex do it the way this written here? How, you, what do you would like us to do? So really, it's just a general consensus of we like this or we think the time frame's wrong or, you know, we want you to go back to the drawing board. So it doesn't have to be a motion or anything like that, okay. but just some, some general feedback that we can take to city council. I personally think it's fine. Yeah. I think it's fine. The time's perfect because it gives everybody a time to cool down a little. <laughs> if you can't cool down in six months, you're not going to cool down. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Be big mad after six months. <laughs> okay. All right, I will, we will pass that along to City Council, um, and as practice, I usually email um, HLPC members and let them know when this is going to come before City Council in case you'd like to attend when they have that item. Okay. All right. <coughs> We're on to the mural. <coughs> this weather baloney is trying to kill me. <laughs> All right, so agenda item 4F is discuss and consider supplement to Nacogdoches Historic Design Guidelines related to murals. Um, so... As you all know, we've discussed this for a few months. This is kind of our progression of our mural discussion. Um, so members of HLPC had expressed a desire to have further guidance on COAs involving murals in our historic districts. Um, so we did talk about this um, at our August 5th meeting, and we talked about it at several meetings before that. 
Um, so HLPC at that August 5th meeting gave us some guidance about potential mural guidelines and asked staff to come up with a draft. Um, and so what we did um, after talking to our city attorney um, and trying to figure out the most cohesive and seamless way to work this in here um, is our proposal is to use our mural guidelines as essentially a chapter 11 of our design guidelines. Um, as you all know, when you had your new member orientation, um, you received a copy of our design guidelines. It's online right now. Um, HLPC has discussed, um, I believe a couple months ago, about updating this document anyway. Um, it was originally printed in 1991, um, so it's a little dated. Um, so what our city attorney and I came up with was um, adding an additional chapter to our design guidelines. Um, this chapter would be all about murals. Um, it would be supplementary, um, but would not supersede or take precedence over the city ordinance criteria because only that can be done by city council. Um, so what we have before you today is our proposal. Of course, it's a draft. If you love it today and you want me to put it right in the design guidelines and take city council, we can. Um, if it needs additional work, if it doesn't have enough meat on the bone, we can add that. So this is just an ongoing conversation. Um, so essentially this chapter 11, um, it starts off with um, giving a brief overview of why we have this chapter in here, saying that it's trying to give um, property owners some feedback and some guidance on murals. Um, so we have four considerations in here. Um, one is consideration should be made for how the mural will conform to the overall historic dis overlay district. Um, two is murals of a historic nature should strive to be historically accurate. Number three is murals should be kept in good condition for the life of the mural. Um, and then four is um, list the following, uh, list the murals that, and types that are inappropriate in the downtown historic, in the historic district, excuse me. Um, and basically it goes into some of the things we talked about last time, that if it's sexually explicit, if it is hate speech, anything like that, those murals are inappropriate. Um, it really just kind of puts that into a guideline. Um, and of course, if this does go forward from HLPC, we would also be incorporating some of the other additions in the design guidelines that were talked about several months ago. Um, which are things like adding the historic district maps, adding a QR code people can scan, new contact information, um, new, new information to our HLPC members, um, things like that. So it's not just updating this one chapter. We'd be adding those other updates we talked about and then presenting that to council um, for approval and acceptance. Um, under each of the four items we put on here, it kind of gives some more guidance to the property owners, just like the rest of our book does. Um, where it'll say, you know, we like these type of signs and here's why. Um, this is the same type of thing where it says here is our, you know, guidance and here's a little bit of direction that will help with that. Um, so I'm happy to hear any feedback y'all have on it, um, any discussion, um, and then we can figure out where we go from here. I think y'all listened very well. <laughs> I don't know who to compliment, but that would be you Jerry. and the attorney That'd be both. Jerry. <laughs> Good job. Jessica and I both. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like we mentioned something about advertisements. If somebody wanted to paint some, um, I, I, I brought that up. Okay. Because some several of the buildings that I have, and you know, have instead of a mural, they have advertisement on, and that's what they did back in the <coughs> turn of the century. They, they they advertised the businesses back then. It was like the coke, you know, the coke sign gets a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other ones that I have, uh, like I say, I have a couple of buildings that have, where they painted on the wall, that's painted on the inside wall, but that was probably the outside wall at one time before they built the building next to it. Mm. And I just think that's more historically correct than actually a, a mural. Of course, a mural, you know, it represents history and explains history to us, but uh, actually back you know, in the day, they had advertisements on the building instead yeah. of actual murals. Yeah. And I just, I don't know, I just, I thought that might be interesting at some point. You know, like I say, the Coke sign, everybody sees that, it gets a lot of attention. And it, the Firestone sign on, on, front of the, on the building up there, that's what they did back in those days. They put their own advertisement on their building. So do you think we should allow that doing modern? I don't know. I don't know. I'm I don't think I, don't, I wouldn't want a modern. No, I wouldn't want a modern sign on there. But you, if you okay. replic replicated one of the 1900 I signs, it was already there. So yes. Think. So could it be um, just brainstorming? <coughs> under, under number two, we have murals of a historic nature should strive to be historically accurate. Um, we could always add something about preservation or repainting of ghost murals, is it, or preservation of ghost murals are encouraged because that's what they typically refer to them as either the ghost murals or the advertising murals. Um, we could add something like that if you want to encourage people to either 
preserve their ghost murals or repoint them or repair them in some way. And of course, well, the I just, second. I just, I, I like some of the advertisements, and it just kind of, yeah, I wouldn't want a, I wouldn't want a Walmart sign painted on one of our buildings. I wouldn't think that would be Good. correct. <laughs> no. Again, that kick you out of here. Not, not that, that <laughs> but, but, uh, but some of the, some of the, yeah, I understand. Some yeah. of the early advertising signs were just, I thought they, you know, they're kind of interesting. Like I say, the one in the, the Shaw Event Center there on. Uh, what is that, 402 East Main? I believe it's 402. It, it advertised cigars. Cheroots is what it advertised, but it said three for five cents cheroots and stuff. Yep. And yeah. It's kind of, I, I just think that was, I just think that's kind of interesting. It seems to me we would handle those individually if someone wanted to do that. that yeah. Yeah, and we could always add something about preservation of ghost murals and discouraging modern advertisements. Oh, absolutely. Um, and that, that may not be the... That's it. But there again, I think we've discussed it you know, before. We don't want a mural or a painting on every wall in Nagadoki. Mm -hmm. you know, right. Too much paint is maybe worse than not enough paint. But, uh, I agree. <clears throat> the part where it says sexually explicit, who determines that? Oh, no. Yes, I <laughs> <laughs> Did, did the Supreme Court say something you know about pornography about when you see it? I'll yeah. know that when I see it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Essentially, the courts. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, that's what it's going to be. I mean, the, the city's going to make a decision saying that's sexually explicit, and we're not going to allow that. I mean, if it's coming before a COA, whatever. Um, and if it's even outside this work, if somebody puts a sign on the side of that's Walmart. Right that's sexually explicit. The city would s step in and say, no, you can't do that. Um, and then it would be challenged probably in court. I mean, ultimately the court would say one way or the other whether we're right or not. Okay. I mean, okay. That's what, I mean that's reality. So. You, this would be great if you had got to plead before the Supreme Court, but we're looking to get them. I mean, you know, <laughs> I wish I had a defendant to say this is sexually explicit and this is not. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately... Yeah. But you do know it when you see The law it. doesn't work that way, unfortunately. And it always comes down to really the eye of the judge and the jury. So the way it would work, someone put, brings it to Jessica, and if Jessica said, no, no, that probably isn't going to work, mm -hmm. she would be the first. She would warn them off. She would. <laughs> and if they insisted, then she would present it to you. Yeah. And uh, then... Yeah. Um, then you would make a decision, and if you said no, we're, we're going to deny the COA based on the fact that you know we don't think it meets our guidelines or and Just our ordinances, you know, our you know yeah. our criteria of approval, and they might say, well, I want I'll see you in court, and, and then we'll go from there. Well, they'll probably first go to the city council, wouldn't they? They they should. That's what they should do. Yeah. Okay. They don't have to. Huh? They don't have they can keep coming back to us forever. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, if they wait 180 days, I guess they can come back and reapply. <laughs> okay, yeah, same thing. I, at that point. Um, would it help if it said nudity or sexually explicit? Would I mean, because what one person may consider inappropriate. I, I would think that would even open the doors even further uh, because nudity is sometimes yeah, referred to you know, as art. <laughs> um, and so... Um, you know, it, it depends on what type of nudity we're talking about. <coughs> and so, again, it, it just opens up even more candor parts. Except sexually explicit, though, it's, it's, is something that is defensible, I, I believe, under the law. Now, what constitutes sexually explicit or, you know, what, what that line is, you know, I wish I could give you a, a bright line. I just can't. I, I can just say that uh, there is case law that, that reverences um, – regulations being upheld for um, items such as this that are sexually explicit and it's then it's going to come down to a fact issue what is it well that that's a that's a moving target sexually explicit 1950 yes. was one thing <laughs> 1900 is another exactly and 2024 it's sexually it's explicit it's, it's changed right so you know 25 years from now who knows who knows I mean, I could just see a mural of a 10-foot-tall naked man or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what 
they're going to put on by the poppy. Won't they? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> he's, a, he's a Spanish explorer, so his stories are correct. <laughs> no, but, it, but no you, you bring up a good point, and this is, we're always dealing with kind of a moving target uh, because mm -hmm. courts across the nation are going to make decisions. They're going to impact how we govern. Um, legislatures are going to come back and make laws, and whether they're upheld or not, they're going to change how we enforce them. And so we always have to be mindful of that. Uh, all we can do is what we have right now, and we do know that there are there is some case law out there that says that we can regulate items that are, you know, sexually explicit, incite violence. Those are the kind of things that cities can regulate and say, no, we won't allow that here. When it comes to political speech, those um, art of any form, that's why murals are such a hard thing to uh, regulate because you're, you're talking about art for the most part and so uh, it, it's it's a gray area and unfortunately I, I just don't have a bright line for you and these things are regional as well what, what might serve in Dallas or California yeah. Yeah. yeah California New York yeah. it's going to be di much different than That's here right. in Texas right. yeah but we're just we're with Jessica here. She's our first line of defense. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Now I'm very scared. I'm, I'm <laughs> <gonna make it. laughs> just, just pulling out of the air, I'm just, just thinking of something. It's probably not not relevant at all. Is there any way you would could I, – I feel like the brush-up Nacogdoches is kind of a professional deal. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that we could run – if somebody, if some property owner wanted a mural that they had to work through brush-up Nacogdoches and instead of – Everybody that wants a mural like we had last month, we had three, you know, one, uh, mm -hmm. one of different deals. Is there some way that we could coordinate all that through Brush Up Nagadocha or some other like entity? like a clearinghouse type. So, so, so they, that way they would deal with us and they would, I, I don't know. I just I just thought of that when he was talking about uh, that moving target. I don't know. <coughs> so there's, there's really not a way for us to do that. It'd be the same thing as if you wanted to do something in one of your buildings downtown. And I said, well, you, you have to run it through this contractor first. Um, so if people come to my office and say, I want to do a mural, how do I go about it? I can always tell them, well, we do have a brushing up NAT group that's doing some murals, so you may want to talk to them about what they have planned in the future so we don't duplicate, but we can't require them to go through a separate nonprofit before they come to HLPC. Um, so that that's just not something we're allowed to do, but we can encourage them to try to coordinate their efforts. Um, no, I, I <coughs> also, it would just be kind of an unofficial, another bureaucracy putting in the way of these people or I I think ultimately we're going to have to do it when they come. Yeah, I think logically though that if people see a lot of things getting approved by brush up that brush up Nacogdoche is recommended and things not getting approved that other people recommended I think they're going to gravitate to them to try to get some guidelines anyway. Well, it yeah. might happen and normal. Get, yeah, just have some normal support. Maybe. I, I know nothing about brush up Nacogdoche mm -hmm. but Seems to me like they they try to focus more on what's historically correct, and and that's what we all that's what we're here for is you know preserve history. And yeah. I just I didn't know if that was possible or not. Yeah, and they do a wonderful job, and I'm happy to tell people because um, usually when I consult with a property owner about a project, um, we try to give them as much information as possible to make them successful. So even if it's something like you may want to look into brushing up NAC or this other thing going on over here to make sure you're not both going to paint flowers on buildings next to each other within six months. So we can encourage them to do that, but there's nothing on the staff side that I can require someone to do that. But I'm, I'm happy to, I want people to be successful um, when they come before y'all. So we always try to try to help with that. To, to sort of continue the uh, the metaphor you were using, Jessica, about using a contractor. Like we can't say you have to use a certain contractor to work on your, your building, mm -hmm. but the city does have like a list of these are contractors we recommend that we've worked with in the past. Um, and yeah, I, I, because one of the things in, in these, um, guidelines that we, we have before us, uh, is talk specific, like the first line says you need to talk to, um, the stakeholders involved to make sure that everybody's on board and they like this mural and it's not going to just get shut down. And I think that, uh, we already mentioned that that is kind of a good idea to have brushing up neck, um, as a recommendation, as people who can sort of like present the mural in a, in a way, um, to get everybody on the same footing. 
Yeah, and that's definitely something the city routinely does. Um, we do have a list of, like you mentioned with the contractors, uh, we always have a list of licensed contractors in the cities, not ones we can recommend. I can always tell people I have personally worked with these contractors or this group, um, so we can't recommend them, but we can tell people, you know, this may be your best course of action, um, but of course if a property owner says, I have a design, I have my own artist, I want to go before them, I filled out the COA, there's nothing preventing them. And there's nothing that staff can do to force them to go to brushing on that first. Um, but I'm happy to have those conversations and try to have people have the best outcome as possible. Is there some kind of procedure when someone comes, a contractor of any kind, comes within the historic district that say they're going to build a building, say I do, mm -hmm. uh, that I tell them to build a I have a lot right next door to my house right now. Mm -hmm. If I say I want to build that, come down for us building permit mm -hmm. does it automatically flag yes so you know it immediately so-and-so has a wants a building permit is that then provisional they don't really have a permit till they come to us correct okay. um the way our system works and our staff is trained and there are some that fall through the cracks as we were uh -huh. switching some permitting systems in the last year or two um so in our uh permitting system all of the properties that are listed in our historic districts say historic district. So if someone comes to pull um, a permit on those, um, they're supposed to be redirected back to my office. Okay, good. Um, we come to y'all with the COA yeah. and then work can begin. Every once in a while people also will go out there without building permits um, and start building <coughs> garages or who knows what. And our building inspectors are very good about it. if they drive around, um, we've been working together for years and they see something in the historic di district being built, they will literally stop and talk to the contractor okay. and be like, all right, what have we done here? Um, have you started? Have you talked to Jessica? And like I mentioned, no system's perfect. There's always a few things here and there that fall through the cracks, but I'm pretty confident that the vast majority of them do come through us Good. first, but there are mix-ups every now and then. Okay, we have the next item coming up, Jessica. So for one thing before we move on to the next one. Okay. Sorry, Jeff. Sure. Um, so as far as these guidelines we have before you, um, is it the committee's desire that we add something about advertising signage, ghost murals, um, as far as modern advertising to be discouraged and ghost mural um, restoration or, pre or really preservation um, would be encouraged. Is that something y'all would like to include I, in here? I don't know if that's a good idea or not. I just, I, I know some of the buildings have those on them. I think the way it stands right now, we could handle them. Like okay. if there was something along those lines, we, we would figure it out. Okay. okay. Um, so I believe... Jerry can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, from here with these mural guidelines, if we have a consensus, because um, we have discuss and consider, so you can make a motion to um, adopt or approve. What would be the correct? I'm trying to think of the correct word. Endorse. I think ultimately the city council will have to approve them, mm -hmm. the guidelines. Could we endorse them? Yes. Yeah. Make a recommendation to the city council to approve okay. them. Well, I, I do like the preservation of the ghost murals. I mean, okay. because that's part of our history, and so I, I like that. I don't know how many there are. Yeah, but, uh, well, there's not a whole lot. Yeah. Well, there. they're on the inside mm -hmm. of Johnny's <laughs> yeah. building, yeah. Well, I, I, I don't mind that. But. We can add preservation of ghost murals to be yeah. encouraged, because we do have a few left in downtown and a, a few, few that were almost partially washed off. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Partially. Partially partially washed off. Um, so we would like to preserve yeah. it. So I'd be happy to add yes. that to it. Okay. Okay, with those provisions, if that's okay, would, do we have, um, I have a motion. I'll make a motion that we endorse this as written okay. with that addition. Is there a second? I second it. All right. Any further discussion? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Well, we will take this to uh, City Council, and like I mentioned earlier, as soon as it's on the agenda, I will email all of you and let you know in case you would like to attend that City Council meeting when they discuss it. Okay. Uh, and our last item of business today is uh, discuss and consider the draft Historic Landmark Preservation Committee meeting procedures. Um, this has come before y'all um, in February um, of 2024. We started discussing this, the need for procedures. Um, HLPC, like Jeff has mentioned, has operated for a very long time certain ways, but we've never really written it down. <laughs> it's just been more by practice. Um, so essentially, these meeting procedures really line out how our HLPC meetings run. Um, we discussed this briefly at August 5th, um, and the committee decided to need a little bit more time to um, review it. 
Um, so, of course, today we can discuss the draft. Um, if you'd like more time to review it, we can do that as well. Um, but essentially, it goes into um, our meeting procedures, the need for a quorum, um, the role of the chair and the vice chair, the role of the historic preservation officer, um, types of requests that <coughs> HLPC hears, um, how a public hearing works as far as who is allowed to speak, when we kind of do that on HLPC as far as like um, Jeff has done this time where you open it at the beginning, let anybody talk, and then the applicant comes later. Um, we've also talked in here, also talks about um, deliberations and votings, appeal of decisions of HLPC, um, and then where all of our records are kept. Um, so I'm happy to hear any discussion or feedback on this draft, or if you need more time to review it, I can put it on a future agenda. That is, that is up to the committee. Any discussion, anybody? I, I, I think it, they're fine. Yeah, I think those ones are fine. Well, does it need to say, uh, as far as the quorum, five members shall be present in person, since that was kind of something we could come across today? Um, let me see. I can add in there for clarification that five members shall be physically present. I, I didn't know if that might need to be. Are you talking about Chris? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. They Chris, said, are you here? <laughs> <laughs> he is here only because you have a quorum in the room. Okay. Um, a, Did you hear that, Chris? <laughs> You're dependent on us. I'm, I'm here in spirit. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we can have members attend virtually as long as you have a physical quorum of okay. the membership in the room. Okay. Um, but I can I can absolutely clarify that that we need to be physically present as a quorum okay. um, for the meeting to proceed. I just thought that might be something we need since we kind of ran into that today. Absolutely. And that was very standard pre-COVID. And then a lot of those regulations changed, and now we've gone back a bit. Jessica, I had, a, I had, I had two people ask you a question, and I really didn't know what to say. It may be that it's the city charter or whatever. But they were really surprised when they found out that you could be a member of this and not live in the city. Yes, so that is in our uh, city boards and commission handbook. Um, and I don't believe it's an ordinance as well. Oh, anyway. Oh, but you have to live or work in the city of Nacogdoches, okay. Okay. Um, and it's stated in that Boards and Commission well, handbook. I'm just glad I have a response now, because I really didn't know, and, and I, I didn't even <coughs> realize that there were people on the board that didn't live in the city. In fact, my first response was, I don't think so, and then they told me, yes, there is. Yeah, <laughs> I said, then, well, I'm wrong then. And how there's much, a few on several other boards, but as long as you live or work in the city, you can serve. How much work do they have to do here? I mean, this could get shady. <laughs> Talking about a moving target, so you I have to. Yeah, <laughs> you have to work for some business that's in the city limits, or live in the city limits. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think you know essentially the policy is to just have somebody connected to the city. Of well, you want someone maybe. to have some skin in the game, right, right. and I understand that, and and I, I I believe that myself, but I didn't really know what to say. Um, and from here on this item, um, of, with the clarification of being physically present for a quorum, um, if the committee is good with these, um, it will really be a vote to adopt these meeting procedures. Um, and then, of course, I would add that addition to it and email it back out to everybody so you have a copy of what our meeting procedures are for HLPC. Um, we are currently following all of these. So it's not going to be any big change at you know, your October meeting. We are just formalizing some of this. Um, and, of course, if we need any other edits, I'm happy to do that as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. Do, we want a motion? Hmm? do we want a motion? Do you need a motion for that? It would be a motion to adopt. Um, adopt okay. these meeting procedures right. as written with the one clarification, if you would like to move forward that way. Anybody, do I hear a motion? Somebody else make it. I make two <laughs> I make a motion that we adopt these um, suggestions, these new uh, committee rules, as listed with the addition of the of the uh, physically present. <laughs> That's the perfect walkout music. <laughs> we're, we're it's really also an embarrassing walkout. <laughs> <laughs> I'm turn my phone off. Yeah. Charles is going to go to a party in I a love minute. It. Okay, let's. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Do we have a, Any who is the second? Sorry. Did you make the motion? I made the motion. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll second it. Johnny Sloan made the second. All right. Any further discussion before we go party? <laughs> All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, that's the end of our agenda until uh, next next time. Yes, in October we will be back to our normal meeting time because there's not a holiday that falls in the middle of it. All right, thank you all so much.